When we pray, does our God hear? When we believe, will we still fear? We pray for peace, dear God, one day, for loved ones who've been swept away. May they walk with you now, hand in hand. May they watch with you now over this great land. When we pray to God, His ears do hear. And when we believe, we shall not fear. So it's a really good thought. George Washington Carver was a man who believed in God. And this is a quote from him. All my life I have risen regularly at 4 o'clock and have gone into the woods and talked to God. There he gives me my orders for the day. And you and I don't have enough life left to do all the things for mankind in a practical way that George Washington Carver did. We went up to Tuskegee Institute and walked through the museum there. It is astounding. In school you learn he did all this stuff with a peanut. You go and talk about somebody. After. He, 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 did, he saved the agricultural south. And he didn't care what color your skin was. He had a truck. He went around to the farms advising them on rotating crops and all kinds of stuff. Uh, we've mentioned before, he always, no matter if he was working in a garden, he had a most beautiful flower he could find on his lapel. And he was waiting for somebody to say, that's a beautiful flower. And he would say, yes, but only God can make a flower. He, he talked to God in very simple, practical ways. If we were fortunate, and we're not all that way, if we're fortunate, we knew an earthly father and mother who loved us. If otherwise, we have an opportunity to change the world so that our children or other children can know people who love them. If we were even more fortunate, we knew earthly people who trusted in the God of the Bible. People like George Washington Carver who could just talk about God. I, I knew a man when I was a teenager that he never quite understood it, but if you were sitting around him in a little while, you found yourself talking about something about God and the Bible, and it didn't seem like he brought it up. It just was so natural to him. If we didn't know somebody like that growing up, we have an opportunity so that through us, others can know somebody who hopes and trusts in the Lord. Let's read Jeremiah 17, 7. Let's read Jeremiah 17, 7 together. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. Isn't that an amazing little verse? Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. We're not really going to look at the back of this today. There's something you might like to look at. It's a little outline, insufficient and all that, of the Sermon on the Mount, which will come up later on in our study. We are going to talk about the wonderful, the everlasting Father. And in the prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 6, after saying, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And let's read Isaiah 9, 6 together. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, if you look at the board, instead of commas, I've got hyphens. And when we mention this again here, it will be hyphenated because I found out that the Jewish manuscripts, that's one name. It's not five names. He's not wonderful on Monday, counselor on Tuesday, you're Prince of Peace. It's all talking about that son that was to be born. 
Hey, you can go on the internet like I did and try to, and you can have people that will talk your ear off who are considered experts who will tell you all about how that doesn't refer to Jesus. It's the only place in the Bible where he's called the everlasting Father. So number one, we're going to talk about that idea, the everlasting Father. Literally, it means Father of eternity, or Father from eternity. Jesus is our life giver. Jesus is the giver of life to everything on earth. And my children call me Father because I gave life to them physically through the ways of this earth. Let's read John chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 and then verse 14. Let's read that together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Bible's not unclear about who God the Father as we think of it is. It's the one that Jesus told us we should pray to. But in Genesis 1.26, and I've taught that for years at the Academy and in other places, when you get to verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. And it says that in everybody's Bible that I've ever looked. It doesn't say, let me make man in my image. But us. There's a plurality of God. And the part of God who took upon himself the sonship to fulfill this prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6 is the one that on earth was then known as Jesus, the Son of God. But we just read that He existed in eternity. Nothing was made without Him. So that means when God shaped man from the dust of the earth and breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, Jesus was part of that. He's our life giver. In that sense, He is our Father from eternity. Not only that, created all of it. He created his friends, his personal, Donald, every one of us. He, he knew us and gave us life in our mother's womb. The Bible says so. But Jesus did call God in heaven the Father. There's a lot of verses we could use. In the Lord's Prayer, how does it begin? Our Father which are in heaven, hallowed be your name. And they'd ask him, in Lucas, they'd ask him, how should we pray? And he says, well, pray this way. Say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then afterward, he told his apostles, when they prayed, to pray to the Father in his name. Mm -hmm. You know? Now, this title, the Everlasting Father, may signify Christ as the Father of life and creation. We've read some verses that certainly sound like that. It may refer to Jesus' sonship from our Father, which wouldn't bother me, but we can still call Jesus the Everlasting Father because the Bible calls Him the Everlasting Father. Now, one note before we leave that is that spiritual father is not a title for men. Matthew 23, 9. Let's read that. And call no man your father on the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. 
he's talking about spiritual matters there. Uh, I could call my father in the flesh, father, dad, pa, or whatever we work out. But spiritually, we have only one father, God in heaven. The Bible couldn't be clearer. And yet, we all know there are people on earth that take a spiritual title of father. Second name, part of the name is the... Um, backwards on these, but the Prince of Peace. We're going to talk about him being the Prince of Peace. Not a lot, but in Philippians 4, 7. Let's read that together. And in the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you've never had that peace, I hope you never have occasion to need it that bad as I have. But in the midst of turmoil, when you feel like you can't go on, you pray to God and a peace sweeps over you and your soul is calm. And the first time I did that, I was astounded. I was astounded. My tears stopped like that. My soul felt like I was being ripped in a million pieces and all of a sudden I was as calm as I could be. It is a peace that's beyond human understanding. And it will keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. Page two. He's the mighty God. We're just going to, we could read a lot of different places. We're going to read Colossians 1, 13 through 18. Let's read that together. And he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That will qualify somebody to be the mighty God. I don't know what it would take. Or what it would take. He is the counselor. Now, in our world today, a counselor is somebody I see if I'm upset, that kind of thing. But the idea of counsel is, the basic idea is good advice. And that's, of course, what we hope to get from a counselor. Jesus is the counselor. And we're going to look at a prophecy back in Zechariah that for some reason gets left out of the loop. And it's of a time when there was a man named Joshua, not the Joshua who fought the battle of Jericho, and not the Jeshua, Joshua, Hebrew form of the name Jesus. But it, this is the way this prophecy was done. It was done in form, uh, in act. Let's read this together. Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them on the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and speak to him, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the Lord Branch, and he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, 
and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne and he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them that is between the two offices under Jewish law kings can't be priests and priests can't be kings end of the matter and if we look at this as a spiritual prophecy, Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our king. Jesus built the church, his temple, that lasts into eternity. And he offers the counsel of peace. Peace from the throne of power and peace from the council of the high priest. Earthly priests have a way of involving people in wars and I don't know what all, you know, and of going out and saying, well, to kill people that disagree with us. You know, the council of peace here is between Christ as our powerful king of his kingdom, the church, and Christ as the high priest one of the great things he does for us is he opens the door so that little old you and me can walk boldly into the most holy place where formal, formal times, former times, only the high priest would be. So that we can enter boldly there, he says, for help in time of need. By our prayers, we can enter the very presence of God. What an astounding thing. Now, what is it that Jesus counsels us to do? In Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which is on the back of this sheet, we looked at it again. It's just a little outline of some of the ideas that are presented in the Sermon on the Mount. I once had a professor who had a zillion degrees of and he was an expert in the religions of the world. And he was a devout Bible believer Christian. And you want somebody to tell you real reasons of the difference. You cannot explain, for instance, how the Jewish people were taught rules of health starting in 1500 B.C. That mankind outside of that religion could discover until about 1920, 1930. And he, he could look at this, he was an amazing man. Having said that, he said the most concise statement of morality in the history of the earth is found. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And of course, the entirety of the New Testament is the complete setting forth of his will. And then on page 3 we come to the matter of wonder. We get to this wonderful love and we've sung about that this morning. Jesus healed I don't know. In, he was in the temple and he healed the blind and the lame. Let's read just these verses from Matthew 21. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying to the temple and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. They were sore displeased. That shows you the kind of people they were, doesn't it? He's doing wonderful things. Can you imagine how a person who had never seen in their life felt when in an instant of time they had perfect vision? A person, I'm reading a little story now about a girl whose leg was smashed when her parents were moving 
by wagon train out to Oregon. And she's lucky to be alive in the story, but it's true. And, but her leg was smashed and she called herself a cripple. Can you imagine being crippled that way, maybe not even able to walk, and Jesus touches you or something, says the word, and you can just go around like anybody else? It's hard for us to imagine the wonder of that that happened to us. Can you imagine how the widow felt as they were carrying her son out to bury him? All prepared and everything. And Jesus stopped her and brought her son back to life. Saved her world. He's wonderful. Jesus cast out demons. Luke 9, 43-44. Let's read that. Everyone was amazed to see God's wonderful power. Everyone was amazed at all the things that Jesus was doing. So He said to His disciples, Listen carefully to what I say. The Son of Man will be betrayed in the hand of the people. The wicked-hearted them to Jesus for the very wonderful things that He's doing. Yeah, just think, if you're going to hate somebody, it should be a, a valid reason. Not that we're supposed to hate him, but they seem like the nicer, the more wonderful Jesus got, the more they hated him. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We're going to read Psalm 139, verses 1 through 14. It starts here and continues on the back. Our wonderful life giver. Let's begin. O oh Lord, oh Lord, you have examined me, and you know me. You will all know when I sit down and when I get up. You read my thoughts from far away. You watch me when I travel and when I rest. You are familiar with all my ways. Even before there is a single word on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You are all around me, in front of me, and in back of me. You lay your hands on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot reach it. Where can I go to get away from your spirit? Where can I run to get away from you? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of morning or go to the most distant shore of the sea, even there your hands will guide me and your right hand will hold me up. If I say, let the darkness hide me, and let the light around me turn into night, even the darkness is not too dark for you. Night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You alone created my inner being. You knitted me together inside my mother. I will give thanks to you because I have been so amazingly and wonderfully made. Your works are marvelous, and your soul is fully aware of this. You read that, and then you read Psalm 104. God brings a baby sheep life from his mother's womb. And when God takes his breath away and dies, you and I are the same. Each of us was a special creation of God. Each of us. It's hard for us 
to appreciate that because science tells us all of the physical ways that things work. And, and that's nice. But if God wasn't there, none of that would be happening. He took us, he took dirt and made human beings. He, he took a rib from Adam and made a woman. He breathes life into our nostrils. And we have life as we know it. When the test for ages of death has been when there's no more breath. All the breath of life. It's a wonderful thing that he does for us. We are amazingly and wonderfully made. Verse 6, the knowledge of this is too wonderful for me. It is high. I can't reach it. So Job, after all of his complaints and the horrible things that he went through, when God spoke to him, said, who is this that speaks and answers without knowledge? All Job felt was his dirtiness and his unworthiness to be thus in the presence of God Almighty. And so this knowledge of how he creates us is too high. We can't grasp it. It's too wonderful. Something that the Bible teaches is that abundant grace abounds to the glory of God. That's a different thought than we usually think about. Let's read the verse and think about that. 2 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15. Let's read that together. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might abound to the glory of God through the thanksgiving of many. Oh. Not like you hear believer repent, you know what I mean? But guess what? It's true. That the abundant grace might abound to the glory of God through the thanksgiving of men. When you and I have a bad day, and we got a lot of praying to get caught up with our forgiveness, and we're so thankful that He'll forgive us. Glory to God. And when a bunch of us get together and do it, you might say a little more glory, abundant glory, that grace may abound to the glory of God. And here's what I was thinking about. This grace is what gives us peace that the world cannot understand. His counsel guides us into His most holy place where we can get honest with God. We are thankful beyond imagination to our wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Christ Jesus. Our thankfulness to God can help others find thanksgiving in Him. The Bible says so if you think and meditate about this a while. Our thankfulness to God can help others find thanksgiving in Him and be part of of the abundant grace whereby God draws people to Himself. His name is wonderful. You know, if you hear about the wonderful things that Jesus did, and you feel like beating Him up or crucifying Him or murdering Him, whatever else is true, you're not ready. <laughs> you're not ready for your soul to be saved. But if you find those things are wonderful, and, and, the, and, and you can join in praise to God for the things we've read about this morning. See? Then maybe you can be part of all this abundant grace and, and realize God draws people to Himself. If, if 
your picture of a Christian is a guy that comes at you with a bike, <laughs> hit you in the head and knock you down, and all you can think of after they leave is thank God they're gone, something's not working right. Because the truth is, when people understand how wonderful Jesus is, how wonderful He was, and all that He'll bless us for in our soul and our spirits, there's a great thanksgiving and grace is just being poured out by the bushel, you might say. God's grace. And that can draw us. Once upon a time, it drew me. See, once upon a time, it drew a lot of us. And thinking back to how we felt before we obeyed the gospel and how we felt after we obeyed the gospel, that's a whole, whole, whole lot of thanksgiving. And you and I are a part of what can draw people to God. It's a wonderful thing to think about. Let's read John 6, 44 one last time in this. We'll close and have our invitation song. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up so there's not anybody that I would pray with, Lord, draw us to me. Draw my soul to me. with a lot together. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we're going to sing number 723 in the room of soul. And we invite you to come and make your needs known. Let me see. Sing them over again to me, wonderful works of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. Of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Send us to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Also, freely Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Songbooks is the Lord's model prayer. Let's say that together. And uh, Donald, would you lead us in a closing prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But thy kingdom come, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And 
Father art in heaven. We do thank thee, Lord, for blessing us and being with us. And we thank you for your wonderful Son, Jesus, who came and died on the cross for us. That Father in heaven, through him, we can have this hope of eternal life. We thank you, Father in heaven, for the sacrifice that he gave. For it was not the nails that kept him on the cross, it was his love for us. And Father in heaven, we thank you for that sacrifice that he did for the resurrection that He gave, that we too, Father in heaven, can be raised up to walk with Thee when our time on this earth is over. Be with us and keep us safe from the evil one. Deliver us from evil. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.